Welcome to All Grown Up Now, Tales of a Checkered Past. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is an evolution of the tale, All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts. This is season two, and it's called Tales of a Checkered Past. It's a collection of short stories from my salad days on up to the present. In each podcast, another self-contained story will be presented. Enjoy. The long silence has been because I've been dealing with the final stages of my friend Stuart's illness. He had pancreatic cancer, complicated by COVID. As I've mentioned in previous years, I'm ambivalent about the holiday season. I think back on significant people from my past, and strangely for me, they seem to pass in the time period between Thanksgiving and January 6th. So just two days before Thanksgiving this year, I lost my dear friend, Stuart. The following Monday, I lost my favorite cousin, Lori. The pain of these losses is too sharp to talk about just now, but I will introduce you to another dear friend lost at this time of the year. So for episode 91, I want to introduce you to Norma. By introducing you to Norma, I'm also introducing what I call the ripple effect. So if I were going to give a title to this particular episode, it would be called the ripple effect. Now, her name was Norma Tringali. She was a towering influence in my life, a friend, mentor, and adopted mother. I wanted to talk about her in the past, but I really couldn't find a way into her story until recently. Before I begin, though, here's a quote from Norma that I think of often. She said to me many times, Life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. This quote is so dear to me that I had it engraved on an ID bracelet so I can wear it every day. This is what I call the ripple effect. I recently received a note from a longtime friend. After reading the note, I realized that this was indeed the result of the ripple effect. This ripple effect is something I learned about from my dear friend Norma. The note. It reads, in part, Hi, Kenneth. Hope you and Andrew are both well and happy. This weekend, I was with my family. My 70th birthday is coming up in a few days. And we were talking about stuff we did with the kids when they were young. At one point, my daughter, who just turned 37 said that meeting you in your San Francisco studio was a turning point in her life. She was impressed with your creativity and talent, and also that you and I were such good friends and continue to be. I'm not sure how she knew you were gay. Maybe we mention it in passing. But her attitude and acceptance towards sexual preference dates back to that meeting. I'm absolutely positive she's not the only person you influence that way, by a long stretch, but I wanted you to know this and to thank you for helping me teach an important concept to my kids. Also, she has a deaf, cross-eyed Siamese, and I told her about Marvin, our blind cat. She was so teary about them. Be well, dear friend. After I read that note, my mind went directly to Norma and the ripple effect. I met Norma in 1983. I was recommended to her by a neighbor who had a tarot reading with her. Norma founded a place called Amron Metaphysical Center, which was on Jackson Street at the time. It later moved to a big old Victorian house on the corner of Van Ness and Vallejo. 
the year before, I'd scheduled a tarot reading there and got a guy named Edmund. He was a total disappointment. Insisting I wasn't really gay, which was so ridiculous. Looking back, though, he was right about one prediction. He said that my trophy husband wasn't the one. He was fun, but he wouldn't last forever, so I give him some credit. That said, I didn't want to go back there, but she insisted. I got the wrong person, she said. I needed to have a reading with Norma. So, for my birthday in 1983, I scheduled a reading and insisted on Norma. But still, I was skeptical, so I decided not to talk too much. She had to prove to me that she was the real deal. I arrived at the appointed time. She greeted me, asked me into her office, and we sat down. Who's the woman with the dress? she asked. I see a wedding, but it's not like you're making the wedding dress, but you're making a dress for the wedding. Mother the bride, I replied. You're studying color, she said. I see lots of color coming from your hands. It's like you know something about color, but you need to learn more. At the time, I was working in window display at Macy's in Pleasanton, and I was also taking a color and design class at City College. I wanted to know more about color theory. I also wanted to change my direction in my career, and I didn't exactly know where I wanted to go. In fashion, of course, but where? Okay, I replied. Yes, I'm studying color. You're dissatisfied and changing your direction. It's like you're taking what you know, what you do now, and directing it in another direction. Are you looking to change your career? She looked directly at me and raised an eyebrow. So have I established some credibility? Norma asked. Could we get away from this skepticism and get to work? And that began my relationship with Norma. During that reading, she told me that the woman, who was actually my first customer, would be a beginning, but she wouldn't be the one who drove my career. The woman opened a door in my mind. Norma also told me that in the next three years, I'd need to educate myself about where I wanted to go, decide the direction, and then I'd be able to leave the situation I was in, not before. She also gave me some insight into my situation with my crazy boss, Carmel, at Macy's, as well as with my friend, Mark. Carmel was the boss I had a chance to kill and make it look like an accident. And I hated him so much I almost did, but reincarnation saved his life. Norma said of Carmel that we had a past life together. In that life, I was a high priestess and he was one of my parishioners. We conceived a child which I aborted. He wanted me to leave the temple and go away with him, which I didn't, thank God. And he was still mad in this life about it. Are you aware of some weird sexual tension between the two of you? She asked. Yikes, I said. I don't even want to think about it. It makes me sick to my stomach. Well, this should be resolved in 18 months, Norma predicted. How long have you been working for him? Oh, about nine months. Oh, God, she said. But at least it's halfway over. So, from then on, every year on my birthday, I would have a reading, and Norma would tell me what the next step was. Looking back, some of this was psychic and some was the prompting of a mentor urging me to take the next step. I decided to design accessories because they don't need to fit to a specific figure. I was advised to focus on hats. This was in 1983, the TV show Dynasty was going full force, and a friend who bought accessories at iMagnon said that it would be a way of making a name quickly, which is something I liked. So... I taught myself millinery and started making hats. All the while, I still worked in window display, but I was able to get rid of the commute to Macy's in Pleasanton and its expense 
by getting a display job at the Emporium in San Francisco. Now, one went from the Emporium to Macy's, but one didn't go from Macy's to the Emporium. It was considered a step down by everybody. But for me, I didn't want a career in window display anymore. I just wanted to make money to support my business. In the meantime, now that I was working in the city, I started a jewelry making class at City College. I figured I could make handbag frames and things like that if I knew how to do that. So the professor of the class, whose name was Roger, introduced me to his sister, Brenda. Brenda was a stylist in Los Angeles, and she eventually became my agent. Now, my friends, as well as my trophy husband, looked upon this as my eccentric little hobby, making hats. How sweet. He thinks he'll be a designer. I, however, looked upon it as making inventory. I started selling some of the pieces in a tiny little boutique in San Francisco on Brady Alley across from the Zuni Cafe called Talayo. But in late 1986, I got my big break. Brenda got me into the very posh store in Los Angeles. I was selling. I wasn't in the black yet, but there was cash flow. My reading for my birthday in 1987 was the start of a closer phase in my relationship with Norma. That birthday wasn't a happy one. I was ill with a stubborn case of the flu, and the trophy husband wasn't terribly supportive nor helpful. He had stopped working his job to go to school to study serious musical composition. That left me to hold up both ends of the finances while funding my fledgling business. I was a little worn out, a lot excited, and thinking this business might go somewhere. I remember what Norma said at the beginning of the reading. She shuffled the cards, I cut them, and she laid them out. Life as you know it will be completely different this time next year, she said. Everything you know, your work, your living situation, everything will have changed. Everything. Be prepared. The universe provides, Norma continued. To make that work, you need to ask. Know what you want and ask for that or something better. What you need might not look exactly like what you imagine, so be a little flexible. She went on to tell me other things in that reading, but that one thing sticks in my memory to this day because she was right. The change had started in early March of 87. I was still working at the Emporium and making product in the evenings and weekends. I'd started getting rich and famous people buying my work at the posh L.A. store. Then one Wednesday evening while I was in jewelry class, Roger came over to me at the blowtorch. Your agent's on the phone, he said. She called here. It's in the office. During that call, Brenda told me that Elton John had bought a piece of my work. I was over the moon. His music was the soundtrack to my teen and college years, and I always loved his clothes. I can die a happy man, I shouted. Not so fast, Brenda said. He wants to see four more vests by Tuesday. They need them in the store by Monday, so you need to get to work. And yes, I delivered. 72 hours with no sleep, but I did indeed get them all there on time, and I told Elton bought all four of them. A week later, Brenda called again. We have another order, she said. They want it for the Academy Awards. Can you do it? Sure, I said. Absolutely. Now, there was a complication. I still needed the paycheck from the Emporium, but I had to start calling in 20 hours a week sick, I had asked to go part-time 
But my boss said no. This was my way around that then. I would just call in sick. Now, as it was at the Emporium, if we called in sick two days, no problem. But if we called in sick three days, it required a doctor's note, just like high school. And I didn't have a doctor. So, this was my plan. I called in sick Wednesday and Thursday. Friday, I went in just long enough to have a relapse and need to go home. I had even worn the eyeshadow I used under my eyes when I needed to look ghastly ill. When I signed out for the day, the people in the personnel department gave me the hairy eyeball. I sensed that I had pushed it too far. But hey, Academy Awards or the Emporium? It was an easy choice. That weekend, though, was a blur. I worked furiously to get the order out and rented my first studio all in two days. The studio just showed up at the right time. It sounds like a movie, but really, this is what happened. I was sitting at my work table in my bedroom, furiously working on the order. I was also thinking that I needed a workspace. Doing this from my bedroom was frustrating, and I needed a studio because I needed space to work. Also, because it helped make me look like a going concern, a real business, not just like some guy making stuff in his bedroom. Now, I had the phone sitting on the work table while I was working and thinking about all of this. When suddenly the phone rang. Hello? Hello, my name is Marshall Crossman. I heard from Brenda that you're looking for a studio space. I just rented a space on 8th Street that I'm looking to share. Are you interested? Why, yes, I said. I'd like to see it if I can. We set a time, and I went over to take a look. It was a large, garage-like space on 8th between Howard and Folsom. There had been a fire, so I could see smoke damage on the walls. They'll paint everything white, Marshall said. We could build a divider wall. I'll get the back half. You get the front. How much, I asked. $275 a month. You got yourself a deal, lady. I left slightly stunned. I had just asked the universe for the workspace, and here it was. Just like Norma said. It didn't look like I imagined it would look, probably because I didn't have enough time to imagine. This was the space... I refer to as the 8th Street Studio. I signed March 15, 1987, quit my job, and took possession April 1st. When I went to work the following Monday, I couldn't decide. Should I quit? Should I not quit? I was worried that I didn't have regular cash flow, and I just signed a lease on a studio space. I got into the elevator. The door started to close. Then my boss, Davy jumped through. He had a look of complete pleasure on his face. Uh Uh-oh. Before you say anything, I'm giving my two weeks notice, I shouted. His face fell. He wanted to fire me. Pity. The first things in my life had changed. It looked like Norma might be right. In May of 1987, I got my first important press and had my big studio grand opening party all in the same month. I wanted it to be a big occasion, but I didn't have much of a budget. My friend Susan rounded up some friends to make me party food. Before the party, I was talking about the food and arrangements with the bishop. He asked me if I had serving pieces for the food. Well, not really, I answered. I have a few silver bowls and platters that my mom gave me. You'll need more. You come to my place this week. I'll let you borrow some things, he insisted. So a few days later, I visited his house in Noe Valley. He opened a bedroom door, and I saw what looked like an Aladdin's cave. The entire room, I kid you not, 
was chock full of silver. Flatware, hollowware, bowls you could bathe a baby in and platters you could serve him up on. It was so full, in fact, that the bishop needed to remove some things just to get into the room. There was that much in there. Now, I assumed it was all fake. So I chose some huge decorative pieces, an enormous punch bowl, some huge platters, some bowls the size of hubcaps, nothing that couldn't disappear into a pocket, you understand. We carted everything out to my car, and I delivered it to the studio. The grand opening party was on a Saturday evening, late May of 1987. With all the fancy silver that the bishop loaned me, all I had to do was press the family linens and buy some white flowers. All the food looked spectacular. How could it not? The bishop showed up right at the beginning with his chosen altar boy. Both were wearing their best liturgical robes, which I had made, by the way. I remember also an incense burner, a holy water dispenser, or whatever they're called, and an antique icon in a gilded frame. The bishop lit the incense, gave it to the altar boy, then they both proceeded to circle the space, burning incense, sprinkling holy water, and performing a blessing ceremony with some incantations in Latin. Norma, of course, was there, nodding her approval. Brenda whispered to me, Now the party's officially begun. And indeed it had. The music went on, the people started partying, and it was a big hit. The buyers from the very posh store surprised all of us by showing up to the party. Their eyes popped at the lavish display of silver that the bishop had lent me for the occasion. Brenda casually told them it was just my family's silver. Now, as an aside, when I took it all back, I found out it was all real and worth about $100,000 at the time. At the end of the party, Norma hugged me and said, Well, sweetie, you're launched. That summer of 1987 was taken up with filling orders. Brenda scheduled a trip to New York to try to sell to Barney's. She knew Simon Doonan through the posh store where he had worked doing windows. So she gave me a list of pieces to make, and I worked 18 hours a day to produce them. It was a grind, and of course the trophy husband wasn't any help. Later that summer, the trophy husband's brother and his partner came to visit. His brother scheduled a reading with Norma. The three of us, husband, partner, and me, picked brother up after the reading. Norma walked out with the brother, who introduced her to his partner and to trophy husband and to me. Now, her reactions to the trophy husband and me were so different they were comical. To him it was a weak, hello, and a tiny wave from across the room. To me, however, it was a big smile, a big embrace, and lots of questions about how things were progressing. After we left, it was remarked upon that we all knew which one of us she preferred. Now, the fall brought the stock market crash and the relationship crash. By the end of December, the ex was gone, I had melted down all my jewelry to fill an order and given notice on the apartment as I couldn't afford it. I put everything in storage and moved into my studio. For the next six months, I would sleep on a broken-down sofa in that damned, unheated space, listening to the mousetraps clacking like castanets at night. But, before I moved into the studio space, Norma insisted on performing a ritual cleansing and for Archangel's blessing. This was the first time I experienced the power she possessed. The blessing was held at night. It involved lots of incense and incantations and summoning of the four archangels. For the first time in my adult life, I had what I knew to be an otherworldly, powerful spiritual experience. I was there as as observer and helper. Norma was in charge. I won't go into the specifics of the ritual, but my part was to circle the space clockwise, holding aloft a dish 
with incense burning in it. Once I had circled the room three times, Norma instructed me to put the incense dish on the work table as that was the altar I would make my work on. At the end of the ritual, after thanking the archangels, Norma looked upward, said in a firm voice, so mote it be, and clapped her hands. The exact moment her hands clapped, the incense dish exploded. Calmly, Norma looked at me and said, now you can move in. By the time of my birthday reading in 1988, I realized that Norma had been right. Everything in my life had changed. Nothing was the same. My living situation, my work situation, and my relationship. For the better part of 1988, I busied myself repairing the damage from the financial and relationship crashes. During that time, I also started going to church regularly at Amron. It was something I felt I needed, a spiritual discipline and a community. Norma always said to me that in her church, I shouldn't just take anything I heard there on faith. I was to believe only what I had direct experience of. This is where I give you a little more information about the woman herself, as I remember her telling me. Norma was born and raised in Paso Robles, California. She was from small-town rural people, not rich or fancy. Norma's grandmother, who was a Christian mystic, saw early on that Norma had the gift. Grandma would encourage young Norma to sit with people and talk to them about the impressions that she had. This generally had the effect of scaring the bejesus out of most of them. Norma's parents discouraged this interest because they were fearful of witchcraft, but Norma loved her grandmother and trusted her. Now, I believe there were two husbands. I remember the second one was in the military, so they were constantly being transferred from one place to the other. For a time, they were stationed in Florida, where Norma took a job managing a cafeteria on the base. The ladies who worked for her were primarily African-American women. One day, she heard a ruckus in the kitchen. When she ran to see what was happening, she found one of the officers attempting to rape one of her employees, a very young black lady. Get off her, Norma shouted to him. He just looked at her. To get her point across, she went over to the counter, grabbed a glass bottle, broke it, and shouted, I mean it! Don't make me use this. Then she rushed him with the broken bottle, and he backed off. Later, Norma got a visit from a group of elderly black ladies. They had heard about what went on. It wasn't what you might think, Norma told me at dinner one night. They all practiced a version of voodooism, and they saw something in me. They took me in and began my education. So, for the rest of her time there, they instructed her. But Norma's time there came to an end when her husband was transferred. She was distressed that her work with them couldn't continue. One of the women said to her, You will know when it's time. We will find you. It was a few years later in California, as I remember Norma telling me. She said there was a knock on the door one day. She opened the door and another old black lady, who she hadn't met, looked at her and said, it's time to continue the work. In 1989, the Catholic Church inherited the building that Marshall and I had the 8th Street studio in. They wanted to get rid of us, Long story, I guess, but the short version was they wanted to sell it, but they wanted to sell it empty. 
So after one too many three-day notices nailed to the door, it was time for Marshall and me to find new digs. So the search was on. One Saturday night, I kept having this recurring dream. Norma and her group of ladies were doing this ritual complete with incense, drumming, dancing boys, finger symbols, the whole thing. I would wake up and think, whoa. Then I'd go back to sleep and the dream would continue. The next morning, I was exhausted, but I dragged myself to church. I walked in and there was Norma. She gave me a look like she knew. Then with a little smile, She asked, So, what did you think about last night? What do you mean? I asked. Last night. You know what I'm talking about. Well, it was something, I said. What was that all for? Casually, she said, Oh, we were just consecrating your new studio space. She knew. Over the years, I had several experiences like this that had only one explanation in my mind. Norma had always told me not to take anything on faith, but to believe in direct experience. This was one such direct experience. As an aside, over the years, there were others. I choose not to detail them here because they were deep and profound. Talking about them feels like I'd be profaning them. But these direct experiences form the base of my belief system to this day. Eventually, Norma's nighttime ritual bore fruit. The space showed itself a month later, the day before the 1989 earthquake, and we signed the papers the day of the earthquake, about an hour before the earthquake to be exact. I still call it the Howard Street Studio. Marshall and I had that space all through the 90s, up to 2004. Part of Norma's mentorship involved how to do business while staying true to oneself. Now, in the mid-90s, I had started teaching sewing, traveling across the country, and I even landed a TV gig. The show, for those who are interested, was called Sewing Today. The host was Nancy Fleming, Miss America 1961. Her talent was sewing. Look it up. You can see it. I was the sewing expert. They made 26 episodes, and it debuted on 200 PBS stations across the U.S. Along with the teaching, I was hearing from people who knew that I shouldn't talk about that gay thing. Now, I saw that this would be another revenue stream, something Norma advised me of. Multiple revenue streams. She used to say this repeatedly. As an aside, she had run an accounting practice, so she understood how business ran, and she clued me in on all these things. So during the course of one of our dinners, Norma addressed my question. She said, When one is regarded as an expert in one area, When one has a good reputation, that gives credibility. And that credibility spills over into other areas. If you provide reliable information and deal ethically with people, they are more likely to listen to you regarding other areas of life. Norma went on to say that while teaching sewing, I could model other life lessons, specifically that I'm not ashamed of being gay that is just one facet of my personality. Pretending otherwise would, well, be insulting to people. They have eyes and ears. They're not stupid. Pretending also would say that it was something to be ashamed of, which I wasn't ashamed. This is when she brought up the term, the ripple effect. When you throw a stone into the water, it creates ripples, she said. One can lose track of how far those ripples travel. It is said that the flutter of a butterfly wing in Tokyo can affect events on the other side of the world. The ripple effect. That conversation confirmed to me that I had to be who I am, and those who wanted to learn from me would, 
The rest who didn't, I couldn't concern myself with them. I would just educate by example for those who could see it. The ripple effect. Which brings me back to this passage from the note from my longtime friend. At one point, my daughter, who just turned 37, said that meeting you in your San Francisco studio was a turning point in her life. She was impressed with your creativity and talent, and also that you and I were such good friends and continued to be. I'm not sure how she knew you were gay. Maybe we mentioned it in passing. But her attitude and acceptance towards sexual preference dates back to that meeting. I'm absolutely positive she's not the only person you influence that way by a long stretch. But I wanted you to know this and to thank you for helping me teach an important concept to my kids. Now, I vaguely remember this visit to my studio. It was just another day, hosting people I liked, showing them my work, doing what I do. But something about that meeting touched her daughter, and by extension, she's gone out and touched others. The ripple effect. From my viewpoint, the pebble tossed into the water was Norma, a very powerful woman who influenced the lives of many during her time here. I am but one of the ripples. My friend's daughter is another. Whose lives we touch by our actions, we may never know. For me, this note from my friend reminded me to be more mindful so that the stones I toss into the water will ripple out in positive ways. An epilogue. Norma seemed ageless to me and seemed to always have been there. The idea that she would not be there, it was something I've never thought about. But by 1999, she was 69 years old and having health problems. For years, Norma thought she had back problems. She just figured that more yoga would help and kept on going. That was like her, press on, ill or well. So she ignored things until one day she was brought up short during a doctor's visit. It wasn't back problems. It was kidney failure. Norma did dialysis for a time, but she eventually succumbed. This was during that time that I seemed to lose the near and dear. Between Thanksgiving and January 6th, I was devastated. I had scheduled a trunk show in Dallas at a very fancy boutique, and this was tremendously exciting. Before Norma passed, she'd promised to sit in her office and meditate while the trunk show was going on to send good energy my way. But she was gone. Or so I thought. My plan was to take the red eye to Dallas for the trunk show, stay at a hotel into the appointed time, and fly home after. At the airport, I sat at the gate, and I felt sad, nervous, and very sorry for myself. I was sad because Norma was gone, and nervous because Norma wouldn't be sitting in her office meditating for my success. While I was engaging in my bout of self-pity, I flipped through the current issue of Vanity Fair. I stopped on a Bruce Weber photo of a beautiful boy done up like a silent screen chic, a la Valentino. I remember a turban, way more skin than costume, red lipstick, pretty. Norma would have loved him, I thought. Norma always had a robust appreciation of a buff young man in a state of undress. Right at that moment, a cold breeze blew down on me from above. Surprised, I looked up. I wasn't sitting under a vent. Where had it come from? 
Then I heard her voice. And you thought I wasn't going to be there. It was Norma. Of course it was. I wish you all a happy holiday and much health in 2022. Thanks for listening. You can get the audiobook All Grown Up Now on iTunes, Audible, and Amazon, or from my website, allgrownupnow.com. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have any questions, you can reach me through the website, allgrownupnow.com. You can follow me on Instagram at Kenneth D. King, on Facebook, at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, kennethdking.com.